Besides moving product, Mexican cartels shake down any business. Legal or not, they don't care. If you don't pay up, the cartels wreck your place or set your land on fire. Mexican civilians have been targeted for a long time now. But the farmers of this little town in Mexico, they've had enough of the cartels and fought back. Tezcalatitlan, December 8, 2023. Armed members of the Familia Mikoacana cartel pull up to the village wearing military uniforms and attempt to claim an extortion fee. Earlier, the cartel showed up demanding a fee per hectare of the farmer's land. Yet, the farmers didn't agree. In fact, the people of the town were done with the cartel's terror. Villagers wearing cowboy hats armed with just sickles and rifles chased down the cartel members and set their bodies and vehicles on fire. This is what the aftermath of the scene looks like where the confrontation took place. The deceased cartel members can be seen on the ground and their vehicles burned. This is what it looks like when oppressed extorted farmers have had enough of the cartel's reign and unite to fight back. As a result of the clash between the farmers and the cartel, 14 people died. Ten of them were part of the violent organization. Unfortunately, four brave villagers met their fate as well, fighting for what's right, and seven others were injured. Officials reported that the regional head of the Familia Mikoacana cartel, Rigoberto de la Sancha Santilan, also known as El Payaso, or the Clown, was among the dead. A year earlier, El Payaso was almost caught by the authorities, but luck was on his side that day and he managed to escape. June 2022. Mexico's criminal investigation agency identified a safe house linked to the Familia Mikoacana cartel and carried out an operation to arrest the wanted El Payaso in order to bring their criminal activities to a halt. Intelligence work revealed that El Payaso lived his life using another identity, with the name of Juan Carlos Garduno Martinez, another leader of a local faction of the Familia Mikoacana in the Guerrero area managed a meeting with this Juan Carlos. When the bodyguards of the two criminals fell asleep at the safe house, the cops showed up and a big gunfight started. The aftermath? 11 criminals were killed and a bunch of prisoners were captured and three officers were injured. The local cartel head of the other region who arranged the meeting met his fate, but El Payaso managed to escape when the police operation escalated. The prisoners were interrogated by the authorities, which led to the confirmation of the clown's identity with a photo. The picture portrayed a 40-year-old man wearing a hat and holding a gun. Target identified. This time, El Payaso wouldn't be so lucky. When videos of the confrontation in Tezcaltitlan were uploaded on X or Twitter, social media did its thing and immediately tried to identify the cartel members by comparing the people in the videos with Facebook profiles. Not long after, headlines started popping up of a photo of a young adult in a purple hoodie holding a gun. They compared him to the guy in the red shirt in the video stating that he was the feared leader of the local faction of La Familia Mikoacana, El Payaso. His lifeless body can be seen on the ground. Was the leader of the faction that terrorized and extorted their local area really dead? It turned out that the guy in the red shirt was just a member of the cartel and not its leader. But soon after, the real clown was identified. A man was walking around the burned-down scene while recording and recognized the leader of the cartel. El Payaso had been burned. It is unclear if the clown burned for his sins after he took his last breath, or if it is the cause of his demise. The Familia Mikoacana cartel took a big loss on the 8th of December. As a powerful cartel, they couldn't let that slide and the cartel does what the cartel does best. They retaliated. 14 inhabitants of the small town were kidnapped. 
When the confrontation ended on the 8th of December, the cartel managed to seize a wounded villager from the hospital. Others among those who were abducted are four children and three policemen that were ambushed and taken captive at a roadblock. Officials said that the people were simply missing. However, the locals of the village told a different story. They mentioned that the Familia Mikoakana demanded that they hand over the leaders that were responsible for the uprising in exchange for the release of the 14 kidnapped children and adults. Soon after, the head prosecutor of the state of Mexico revealed that the cartel had not asked for ransom to free the kidnapped people, which indicated that they were indeed kidnapped. In a statement, the head prosecutor mentioned that the villagers won't be charged for the confrontation on the 8th of December, as it is seen as legitimate self-defense. The farmers were clearly protecting themselves from the cartel. This cartel is known for ambushing the police and their violent ways they go about their business. In the 2022 massacre in the town of Totolapan, in the state of Guerrero, 20 townspeople were robbed of their life. The attackers killed the mayor, his father, and 18 others who were all men. La Familia emerged in the 1980s in Mexico with a noble cause to bring order to Mecoacan, standing up for the poor and offering help and protection. Initially, they were a group of vigilantes fighting against kidnappers and drug dealers. They were their sworn enemies. Yet over time, La Familia transformed using its reputation to become a powerful criminal gang. Crime syndicates and cartels often use fighting for a good cause as a way to boost their image, ending human trafficking, offering protection, bringing peace and stability, you name it. But in the end, it's all smoke and mirrors. In the 1990s, La Familia took the stage as the paramilitary arm of the Gulf Cartel, aiming to control the illegal drug trade in Macoacan, battling rival drug cartels. While starting alongside Los Zetas in 2006, they became an independent drug trafficking operation. At one point, the collaboration between La Familia and Los Zetas turned from an alliance to rivalry. La Familia also had close ties with the Sinaloa cartel, led by Joaquin Guzman. They rapidly became one of Mexico's strongest cartels. After the capture of La Familia's leader in 2011, the Mexican police declared the cartel as disbanded. However, they continued to exert their influence in Mecoacan and Guerrero. Two years prior to the capture of its leader, the cartel even proposed to stop and even halt their operations, but only if the government promised to keep Mecoacan safe. President Felipe Calderon's government refused and didn't want to talk with the cartel. According to various sources, La Familia Mecoacana got more involved in Mecoacan's politics, supporting their favorite candidates, giving them money for their campaigns, and pressuring other parties to quit. La Familia is known for being extremely violent. They use murder and torture to control rivals and gain support in Mecoacan. At one point in time, they were even the fastest growing cartel in Mexico's drug war with strong family values and a cult-like religion. Just as other cartels, La Familia brought drugs from Peru and Colombia through the port of Lazaro Cardenas in the state of Mecoacan. They mainly produce methamphetamine in the Sierra Madre Mountains. When the organization experienced exponential growth, they turned into a big criminal organization and pseudo-state in Mecoacan. They force businesses to pay them by means of extortion, settle local disputes, and even fund community projects. Despite being the new kid on the block, they're Mexico's biggest methamphetamine supplier to the U.S. They also sell marijuana, Colombian snow, and other drugs. According to more recent reports, the Familia Macoacana cartel is a big distributor of fentanyl. In 2021 alone, more than 108,000 people died in the U.S. due to drug overdoses. That amount was largely driven by an increase of fentanyl compared to previous years. Additionally, they often use fake police uniforms to trick and kidnap victims during fake inspections or reports of stolen vehicles. La Familia has also bribed local politicians and killed many local government officials in Macoacan including two mayors. After infiltrating and establishing authority, the cartel takes control by appointing local police chiefs. 
In 2009, the Mexican federal police arrested 10 mayors and 20 local officials from Macoacan, suspecting they were linked to the cartel. Whenever there is power, greed, and money, there is corruption. The Mexican government seems to be losing its grip on the country, with the cartel's growing influence and power. The core of the problem is corruption in the Mexican government. But do you know what's worse than corruption in the Mexican government? Not being subscribed to crime cartel. We produce well-researched crime documentaries about true crime, the mafia, and interesting cases. So subscribe to Crime Cartel and don't miss out. Corruption within the Mexican government is so widespread that it has become an institutionalized part of how the government works. The people don't like it, yet it has become unavoidable. The roots of this corruption trace back to when the country was still a colony. The way the political and legal systems are set up in Mexico has made it easy for people in power to take advantage of their positions. Over time, Mexican cartels became more powerful, and that has just made the corruption problem worse. Everyone has a price. The important thing is to find out what it is. Pablo Escobar in addition to the corruption within the government, the United States also played a pivotal role as to why the Mexican cartels are so powerful and rich. Surprisingly, the U.S. has a special relationship with the cartels and Mexican government. It started during World War II, when the U.S. needed opium for making morphine. Mexico became a partner because it was seen as a good place to get opium. The U.S., however, openly told Mexico to stop the drug trade while secretly buying opium from them. This led to a period where Mexico allowed opium trade, creating a new group of opium and drug farmers. When the war was over, the U.S. didn't need the opium anymore, but Mexico kept producing the substance. The operations in Mexico became more secretive and at the same time more profitable. When the American soldiers returned from the war, they were dependent on opium, becoming addicted, which in turn increased the demand. Of course, the Mexican traffickers supplied the drugs. In fact, the farmers and cartels were happy to supply it as they were making a fortune. It allowed them to bribe officials and even fund their own armies. Rather than stopping this, the Mexican government decided to set up a system of bribes and kickbacks in the 1970s. Everybody played a part. The Mexican army guarded the drug plantations, and the federal judicial police transported the drugs. The Mexican Federal Security Directorate made deals with drug lords, and in return the cartels paid a tax of $60 per kilo to the government for protection. This money was shared among officials. There are allegations that Mexico's president, attorney general, and secretary of defense knew about these operations and even supported them. In the highest levels of government, everyone had a role, and they were all rewarded for doing their jobs well. What is this to do with the farmers in Texcaltitlan and the confrontation on the 8th of December? Well, if the government didn't enable the cartels to grow so powerful, maybe they would not exist today. The corruption within the military, law enforcement, and the government has a long and wild history. The Mexican Federal Security Directorate, or DFS, the Federal Judicial Police, PJF, and Anti-Narcotics Prosecution Office, or FEDS, are all organizations that were created to fight drug trafficking and handle national security issues, but many of their members were found working with the drug cartels. These officers took risky but powerful positions. They received money from drug smugglers while making it look like they were doing their jobs. The competition for these positions was fierce, as they were very lucrative. The DFS, Federal Security Agency, worked with cartels for government-approved operations and became corrupt. Kind of ironic that an already corrupt organization is able to become corrupt. One of its founders, Rafael Guajardo, became a drug lord for the Guadalajara cartel. Another founder, Captain Rafael Chavari, appeared to be working together with Jorge Moreno Chauvet, who is known as the Al Capone of Mexico. Drug kingpin Felix Gallardo, who is known for the murder of DEA agent Enrique Kiki Camarena, had protection from the DFS. They even had their own DFS badges and worked closely with the DFS chief. 
As the corruption grew within the DFS, President Miguel de la Madrid disbanded the organization. Instead, he relied on the PJF, Mexico's federal police, to handle anti-drug operations. Not long after, the PJF also became infested with corruption. Drug Lord El Chapo Guzman confessed in 1993 that the PJF head in Sonora took bribes to let El Chapo grow marijuana freely. The list goes on. A PJF chief had ties with the Tijuana cartel and received bribes on the regular. He helped traffickers to avoid capture for bribes, while playing the other side as well. There is also speculation that he assisted in coordinating the alleged state-ordered assassination of Cardinal Jesus Ocampo, who apparently knew too much about connections between officials and drug cartels. However, this was never confirmed. The Anti-Narcotics Prosecution's Office, also known as FEDS, which is responsible for investigating drug trafficking, also appears to have faced corruption. The head of the agency, Jesus Gutierrez Rebolo, was arrested in 1997 for helping one of the richest drug lords to ever live, Amado Carrillo Fuentes. More than 700 anti-drug agents were investigated for corruption. The agency was dissolved in 2003 after agents attempted to extort a drug cartel for millions of dollars in exchange for the release of two cartel members and five tons of marijuana. With many federal agents corrupt, it has become a piece of cake for cartels to corrupt law enforcement. The policemen are often bribed, and when they do not want to comply, they are intimidated by drug cartels. They receive low salaries making them vulnerable to cartel bribery. Many police officers worked as drug enforcers while allowing drug smugglers to do their work. By taking bribes and looking the other way, policemen can easily double or triple their salary. But it is not only the agencies and the police that are compromised. Even the military plays its part. In 1991, the Navy secretary took bribes, and in the beginning of the 21st century, two generals were charged with bribery and collaboration with cartels. In addition, during President Felipe Calderon's war on drugs, more than 10 military officers were charged for helping narco-traffickers. Corruption is widespread in states outside Mexico City, especially along the borders and Gulf of Mexico, where most hubs of the trafficking supply chain are present. Drug cartels have enormous amounts of influence in these areas, often having more power than law enforcement. Governors in these states are continuously involved in corruption with drug cartels, facilitating drug passage and providing immunity in exchange for bribes. Reports exposed governors in states like Guerrero, Quintana Roo, Jalisco, Veracruz, and Morelos for having corrupt ties to drug trafficking in the 1960s, 70s and 80s. They received lavish bribes for helping drug traffickers avoid the law. The governor of Sinaloa in 1962, Leopoldo Sanchez Celis, was friends with a notorious drug trafficker, Miguel Angel Felix Gallardo, highlighting the cartel's influence in elite circles. In some places, cartel influence showed up as suspicious foreign investments, like large amounts of money poured into hotels, restaurants, housing developments, foreign exchange agencies, and car dealerships in Jalisco in the early 1980s. The Jalisco state governor, Enrique Alvarez del Castillo, hid these investments, and authorities didn't even bother to investigate further. These cases all happened some time ago, but there are many more which happened closer to the present. Meet Gennaro Garcia Luna, former head of Mexico's FBI and former Secretary of Public Security. In 2013, Forbes included him in a list of the 10 most corrupt Mexicans. A heavy accusation, and that didn't sit well with Garcia Luna. He wrote a letter to Mr. Forbes stating that his inclusion in the list lacked journalistic integrity and was based on lies. Yet, in 2018, during the trial of drug kingpin El Chapo, the brother of his right-hand man, El Rey, or the king, admitted to bribing Garcia Luna with $3 million. He testified in colorful detail about the meeting that took place. 
The Sinaloan drug lord watched his lawyer handing over the duffel bags with $3 million to Mexico's finest government official at a Guadalajara car wash. The king explained how his group paid the money in order to be allowed to integrate into Mexican law enforcement agencies. They even received government uniforms, which they used to raid rival cartels or escape raids themselves. Fast forward one year, Dallas, Texas, 2019. Garcia Luna is arrested and is accused of accepting bribes worth millions of dollars from cartel bosses. February 21st, 2023. Garcia Luna has been found guilty of all five charges by a federal jury in Brooklyn, New York. This verdict makes Garcia, who was once the highest-ranking law enforcement official in Mexico, a convicted felon. Who lacks integrity now? I guess Mr. Forbes was right to include him in the list of most corrupt Mexicans. The cartel infiltrates and influences part of the government, and as enforcers and even the elite on their payroll. But that doesn't mean the government isn't kicking back on crime. It's just very challenging. The farmers fighting back against the cartel on the 8th of December in Texcaltitlan is a sign of hope for the Mexican people. Subscribe to Crime Cartel if you like watching well-researched videos about crime. And if you want to find out who the richest criminals of all time are, click the recommended video right now. We all know Pablo Escobar is at number one, but I'm sure you've never heard about number two. Click the video right now.